gonna set you over here. Just, there we go, line of sight. See my friend Adam. So I am, I am, I am uh, I'm tired. I've been going, going at it for a bit today. Um, right up until the last minute. So um, I'm explaining to the live streamers if I sound subdued, it's not because anything tragic has happened. I promise it has not. Not today. Um, just, just worn out. So it's a very good day to talk about the last fruit of the spirit in our list. Temperance. <laughs> Temperance. Um, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started. Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross, the empty tomb. Father, I, uh, I thank you for the life that you've, that you've given us. Lord, we all have our lot, but your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Any journey we walk with you, even if it's to the cross, is still so much better than anything this world has to offer without you. I'm sorry that I have to say this world and not be referring to a Christian world. I know that that was always your vision. And Lord, I, I believe that you'll make that come around in your time. So Lord, until that until that day, when without having to bow the knee to Satan, this world will be yours. We believe that it is. And in going into this passage tonight, we, we're going to read about how to live as citizens of your world, your kingdom. So... The best I know how, I'm asking for your help as we discuss it, Lord. And It'd be cool if we could pick up on something we hadn't seen before, but if not, then let us just be reminded of, of things that we knew and, well, things we need to be reminded of on a regular basis. So I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. amen. It's interesting because Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And uh, I think there's like 30 different ways he meant that, you know. Um, but I think one of the ways that it comes across to me is if you if you look around at the world system, especially in Jesus' time, there was this hierarchy and a caste system, as it were. And one of the cool rippling and cascading effects of Christianity in the West is that we typically eschew a caste system, even without linking Christ to those morals, which has many faults. But still, I think it's really cool to see that upside down kingdom in force in the American dream. When, though I, though I would caution against the pursuit of happiness being uh, as important as life or liberty, I think the main goal was that everybody has a shot. And that's not a random thing. That's the Jesus thing. When he stood in, in, in the, on the hill and when he gave the Beatitudes, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the broken ones, blessed are, he was talking to people who never had a shot before. And Jesus was here to give them a shot. And uh, most importantly, a shot at right standing with God through Jesus Christ. And um, yeah, I don't know. You ever uh, won the lottery? No? Okay. Then have you ever, <laughs> ever got a raise at work or maybe got a really good job and you were really happy when it happened? Um, but uh, maybe before too long, it, it the excitement wore off or... Like with the raise, you're like, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with all this extra money? I've never had that problem. But um, someone says, oh man, this means I'll bring home an extra couple hundred bucks a month. Mm -hmm. You know, that's great. I'll just put it right into savings. <laughs> but then before long, you find yourself like, wait, where did that margin go? You know, we adjust our standard of living to what we're making, you see. So because we kind of get used to something really good, um, that, uh, I'm going to bring this forward a little bit more. There we go. That, uh, what, what do they call it? They call it um, the law of diminishing returns. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I, I don't smoke cigarettes. I tried once with a friend of mine in my adult years because he was out there smoking at the parking lot and I was talking some theology with him. And so I said, I'll grab one from you and, you know, smoke with a buddy, camaraderie. And I thought, Oh, how can you put this in your mouth? This is like, it's it's just ash. It's all it is. It's ash. There's no ah. flavor. It's terrible. I don't know how he does it. Oh, you know, but uh, at least with the pipe, you have some fresh, moist tobacco leaves. You get them right. Oh, come on. There's some flavor there. But with Keeps the, you busy, too. Oh, yeah. See, the pipe, the benefit of a pipe. This isn't like Smokeology 101, although I did read an excellent poem by a Puritan theologian about, about smoking. <laughs> it was great. It was, it was the virtues of it. Um, but anyway, there was this guy who was actually, uh, I'll get back to my, I won't, I got a string tied around my finger, just like Clarence. All right. Um, <laughs> But there was this guy uh, who would 
he would smoke. But by the time it took him to undo the tobacco, to pack the pipe, to pack it three layers, and then he, he didn't want to smoke anymore, you know. So he'd go smoke a second, and then he'd be done and throw the rest of it away. And uh, and uh, so it's, it's, it's because it takes you so much time, um, and it doesn't have like jet fuel in it. It's much much it's much less of a hazard than a cigarette, though no amount of smoking is probably safe. Um, then again, no amount of walking in the street is safe. You got to pick your poison, I guess. But um, anyways. Now, back to the star, as it were. Um, so I've never tried smoking. I've never smoked, as it were. Give me just a second. I want to finish my train of thought or I'm going to lose it. Okay, I've, okay. I've lost it once already. Um, but they say that when you, and you guys know where I'm going with this already. I was talking about the law of diminishing returns. I really want to smoke. And maybe if you haven't smoked for a while, that first one hits and it's just something else. Ooh, mm. And you feel the chill and you get the goosebumps maybe and you feel that, that bite. Oh. You can tell I've struggled with an addiction before, right? And so you just like, for me, it's sugar. That's my thing, sugaring carbs. Uh, that's, that's, that's my addiction. And I, I'm, I'm not afraid to talk about it like it actually is an addiction because it is. And, um, but then let's, let's shift gears to carbs because that's where I have more experience. But then uh, even though you, you hadn't had a slice of carb, glutinous, cheesy pizza in a long time, and you take that bite and you're like, I can't live without this after all. I'm never getting back on the wagon. But then maybe you do it for a second day in a row, and then all of a sudden, um, it's not that sweet anymore. It's not that special anymore. Because our bodies, physically or metaphysically, materially or immaterially, we always find a way to close that gap. Because we, we get used to things really easily. And the biochemist will tell you it has to do with our dopamine and things like that, and that's correct. But simply because we can reduce it down to chemicals doesn't mean that that's simply the feeling is of some of those parts necessarily. So anyways, more on that never. I guess my point is, um, have you ever gotten a raise? Have you ever gotten that snack? And so we're finally bringing it back home after seven minutes of discourse. It really has been seven minutes. Oh boy. Um, the Christian life can be that way pretty easily. It's easy to look back and say, man, when I was first saved, when I first trusted Christ, when I went into the waters and came out of the waters, I was a Christian and man. And then it's easy to look back and say, well, I've backslid a lot since then. Well, I'm the last person in the world to say, take it easy on yourself sometimes, but maybe it's not backslidden. Maybe you're just as spiritual now as you were then, but the specialness might be gone. That twinkle, that sparkle might be gone because it's not so-called new. That's when you get uh, married and meet your love for the first time. I thought about using that illustration, but my wife's sitting next to me. And so, no, I'm just joking. Okay. <laughs> but hey, that's why a lot of marriages fail. Because you're sure they're the one. And then all of a sudden, after a couple of years, eh, you know. Oh, he's the one. There you go. I can't but and happy anniversary, by the way. Eight years, right? Oh. Happy anniversary. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, your marriage is actually a really good example because uh, I'll never forget what the late. Romeo Bellinger told me, he said, every time I wake up, every morning I wake up next to the same woman. He goes, and I have a choice as to whether or not it's going to be new. And uh, for the rest of my days, for the rest of my days, he was actually saying that in reference to practicing communion. I had a hesitance to practicing communion every week, uh, which I now strive to do. Adam helped me with that. I'm thankful. Um, because I wanted it to be special, but being special is a choice. It's easy for something to be special when it's only once in a while. It's harder for it to be special. It takes more effort. Of course it does. We're humans. I just explained to you in seven minutes why. I'm thankful but, too because I miss doing it weekly. Yes. Yeah. Previous. Yeah. And, you know, when, when, I, when I came here to pastor, I had always been in a denominational tradition where you did it once a year on a Tuesday night, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and it was closed, you know, fenced in, hardcore. And now I, I don't believe it's that way at all. I don't, I don't think the early church did it that way. So, what's that? Yes, I'm so sorry, Adam. I didn't come back to you like I said I would. Forgive me. Okay. Well, two things. <laughs> Here we go. About the smoking. Oh. Uh, I've talked to some experienced people uh, who, who had a habit of doing it because they yeah. used to work in the food industry. Yeah. I mean, I still do, but sure. I do now. Yeah. But when I was working in restaurants, um, a lot of people would go take smoke breaks. Yeah. And what they told me was it's a stress reliever because they deal with a lot of the problems from the customers. 
Yeah, oh, yeah. It can be a stress reliever. In fact, regardless of whether or not it's smoking, any any particular um, fixation can be a stress reliever. Somebody Sometimes people come home from work and they'll play video games at a stress reliever. Sometimes they'll go to the gym as a stress reliever and sometimes they'll do smoking. Some, some of those fixations are healthier than others for the body um, and all things in moderation. You can work out too much. You can play video games too much. Everything in moderation. I have a blog post about that called, it's well, the, the title is... Uh, so it's there's a blog post on it anyways, and it has to do with uh, cores and churros and uh, and uh, how anything can be abused. Uh, in fact, sin is simply an exaggeration of something that is good. Stress reliever, I think it's good. It becomes sinful when we do it at the expense of something. But you said you had two things. I want to hear what the second one okay, was. Okay, well, another thing. Um, the communion thing, um, I was going to add this. There were some people that were refused from from the table in First Corinthians eleven because they they weren't right. Like Paul even said, like uh, that that's a man. You know, this is this is a serious thing to examine your heart mm -hmm. to examine before before you take communion. He said, if you're hungry, eat at home. This is not for people that are hungry. This is for people to remember. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Well, it's so, so yeah, you're, where you're going is right on. So examining yourself actually belongs to a, um, the instruction of many are sick and they're dying because they're not examining themselves. So they go together as a couplet. The other half of the couplet with coming to the table with a carnal heart, um, they were indeed a caution to stay at home if you're, if you're hungry. I don't think Paul had the, because the Lord's Supper then was not little wafers and tiny cups. It was an actual meal. That's what the Lord's Supper was then. Maybe a little bit more like the Passover meal, though mm -hmm. I, I wonder if it was a Seder because the Seder was fulfilled in Christ. So I think it was probably more or less a, a casual meal that they did. And it was, it, was, it was actually, believe it or not, probably a potluck style. Everybody seemed to bring something to share. Um, but there were those who would rush to the front of the line and they would eat before everybody else got there because it's an event-based society, event-oriented society, not a time-oriented society. So people would just show up to assemble on the Lord's Day. And they would see the food and they would get there and they would cut in front of the line. They would eat. And then there were some people at the end of the line who didn't have anything to eat. So Paul says, if you're that hungry, you need to eat at home before you come to church. You see, that was Paul's instruction. It wasn't ever Paul's intention for people to not come and participate, but rather that they would participate with a heart um, of service. Uh, with, that's one of the reasons, actually, when I say, hey, let's have a potluck. I do have an expectation that everybody chips in in some way. Absolutely, I do. Um, because it's not my expectation, that's a biblical expectation. Does that make sense? Um, and so a lot of times folks are like, oh, man, I'm, I'm looking forward to eating. I was very hesitant to eat last Sunday because we weren't able to bring anything. I say weren't able. It was my foible. Um, I did not do what I said I would do. Um, I took the reins and then let the horses run away. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but all that to say, uh, uh, Cheryl, she said, hey, I brought plenty. I'd love to share with you. And with enough cajoling. She did twist my arm because she had gluten-free, mm. vegan cheese dip. Oh, it was so good. That. It was so good. So it was great, and it was it was delicious, and she just nailed it. Um, so the, the caution for the Lord's Supper is to not think of oneself and one's belly, but rather to look at it as an opportunity to spend time together as a church family. Food is almost secondary to the fellowship. So I'm coming in late, obviously, but I was brought up that if you felt like you weren't right with the Lord. Yeah. Communion, you didn't take communion. Mm. You can't pray right before communion. Like, yeah, yeah. Forgive me my sins, you know. Yeah. Whatever I've done this week or whatever. I was brought up that if you if you don't feel you're as close to the Lord as you should, or you haven't done, your relationship with the Lord isn't there, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that you shouldn't do mm -hmm. that. You know, it's tricky, right? Yeah, it's tricky. I was raised that way, too. I, the, the passage with priests, examine yourself, and if you're not right before God, you could die. And, and that you should have cleared up anything you had. So correct. Else. Correct. Yeah. I believe that Paul's intent there, for what it's worth, examining yourself, there's two approaches. I like both um, better than the alternative with which I was raised that you mentioned. One is examine yourself to be in the faith. Paul used that secondary or that, that understanding of it in Second Corinthians toward the end, examining yourself. I don't think that's what it is. Um, worthily would very likely have to do with the surrounding context in which Paul was talking about people who had outwardly rebellious lifestyles, which seemed to indicate that they weren't in the faith because of their lifestyle. These were the kind of people who were charging to the front of the table, stuffing their faces. And Paul says, well, th th 
you're not you're not taking it worthily. And when we think worthily, we have this thing in our head of saying, I'm not worthy. But that's Paul would probably even today might even use the term appropriately or or um, as is fitting or expedient for the, the, the Lord's Supper Memorial. So in other words, people were abusing it. And just like Ananias and Sapphira, they were showing up thinking about themselves, God made an example of them in the early church. And I think that was happening in the church of Corinth as well. So if somebody were to say, Britt, I don't feel like I can take communion because I'm not right with God. My, my first question would be, why, why, frankly, why are you not right with God? Well, I, I sped in my car the other day. Well, you seem broken up about it. Yeah. That's not not being right with God. That's called being human. That's called sinning and wanting to do right. I mean, <laughs> Because if that makes us not right with God, nobody can take the Lord's Supper because then we make it these weird human metrics and subjective um, uh, uh, degrees of uh, how right with God someone. And does that make sense? So then one so then one comes to the conclusion of, well, what does it mean? I would say if someone, like you said, Susan, somebody has ought or animosity with someone, especially within the church, that's Paul's emphasis there. Um, that's a big deal. And then if someone is carrying on an openly rebellious lifestyle, um, I think of, and again, I'm to be a very transparent. I want to be a pastor who talks about issues that people actually struggle with, but immorality with the eyes. As a kid, I struggled with that. There were sometimes it was where I say, boy, I, I never want to do that again, right? And you get rid of all the magazines, you, get, you know what I'm saying? But then there's other times where you, you're you pretty sure you're going to come back to it anyway, so you don't go as nuclear and trying to get rid of it in your life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. If it makes you more comfortable, use a diet illustration. This was, or, or, or somebody's an alcoholic, they pour the booze down the sink. They don't leave it in the cabinet, right? So I think Paul's illustration is, is it still in the cabinet, right? Are you pretty sure you're going to go back to this? Then, then I think that needs to be made right. I don't think you're serious about a commitment to Christ. Um, or every single time you stop by on the way home and buy a pack, and then you end up throwing it in the trash when you get home, right? You know, after you smoke one, you say, I'm never going to do this again. I would say that's a sign of progress and a sign of somebody that's a heart aligned with Christ, though they're stumbling, if that makes sense at all. Um, so I'm not contradicting you, rather. I'm just kind of building on what that's you're saying. Like he doesn't want you to be warm. He wants you to be cold. Or, or Hot or cold or lukewarm. Yeah. So lukewarm is like, well, I'm kind of practicing yeah. faith. Yeah, yeah, really. yeah. So there were two, what Toby's referring to is the aqueducts in Laodicea. Um, there were two aqueducts, just like there's two. Amber and I were watching this program last night. Doctor Who, great theology. No, we were watching Doctor Who, right? Yeah. Who are you? No, we were listening to the Who. No, I'm just joking. Um, and we noticed that there were two spigots on the sink, one for hot and one for cold. And I said, that reminds me of Zambia. And of course, Zambia is colonized by the British. And so you can expect to see a lot of things like that there. And Amber stated that um, she read or heard someone say that one of the most shocking things about America was it's that just a video. A video social media of some kind. Right, where they said the most shocking thing about America is the hot and the cold both come out of the same spigot, you know, where you could actually adjust it and make it a warm temperature, you know. So so um, John, speaking for Christ, the revelator, right, is, is, is saying these things to these seven churches. And he said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. Cold has a purpose. Hot has a purpose. Lukewarm, that meant that, that the aqueduct was not functioning correctly. It was a putrid mix of the yes. two that nobody wanted. You say, wait a minute, lukewarm sounds pretty good. You know, I don't know, but the, the point, right? Now I've heard that message preached where he wants you to be on fire for God or he wants you to not be on fire for God. Uh, and I think that's a, that's just based on a misunderstanding of what the aqueducts yeah, of Laodicea were all about. Talked about that. Oh, did he really? The cold is refreshing. I the love it. is healing, uh, you know. Yes. That they may know, is that the series? Yes, that they, they may know, that the world may know. World Ray Vanderlaan, oh, Vanderlaan, yeah. He was phenomenal. Um, we actually watched that in my Christian high school in like history class. So it was really fun. I am going to get to temperance. In fact, I found a perfect segue about 10 minutes ago. So hang in there. This is good. This is profitable. We're having a blast. I think, right? I think this is profitable. Um, just a guided discussion about some random church stuff. This is church, man. Okay, sorry. Now that I'm done meta commenting on what we're talking about. Uh, but yeah, Toby, I think you bring up a good point is Paul says, be in or out um, in, in this regard. Stay home if you're not going to take the Lord's Supper well, um, but come. I think Paul's, Paul and Jesus had the same mind as the invitation's open. The invitation's open, but you can't come on your own terms. That's, that's the funny thing about church. I think in a few years, I'll finally be bold enough to say, <laughs> you know, hey, here's our church. This is what we do as a church. We all show up. We all help out. We all give. We all serve. We all spend time together. You know what I mean? And I feel like we do say that now, but but 
But I almost want to say, if, if you're not coming to bring something to the table, then what are you actually here to do? You're here to participate in that you're here to withdraw, but there's no deposits being made. Does that make sense? Mm. I hope it does. Um, and I think that was Paul's mentality and his mind toward the church as well. And it was his mind toward the Lord's Supper. You realize why we call it a service. I told you this a few weeks ago. I call it a service because it used to be that it was so oriented around the Lord's Supper that it was a service of the communion. And um, so church has always been uh, at least more oriented toward the Lord's Supper. And I think it's a great example of, do you come to take or do you come to give? Do you come to do both? That's what community is all about. That's what it's all about. Um, which is, as I shared in the church chat, um, what last week, somebody said, hey, pastor, what are we doing for supper? And I said, man, honestly, guys, I, I, I grow a little weary of doing potlucks, but, you know, it, I, I really don't know what direction to go because, you know, um, I don't want it to be where five or six people are bringing food and, you know, six to ten people aren't bringing anything. That's not fair to everybody. Does that make sense? And it actually reflects yeah. kind of an unhealthy, disjointed. Now, there's some people who can't. And that's one of the biggest purposes of the potlucks, right? That's huge. But there are people who can't, right? And no one's fooling anybody. I can, and everybody knows I can. And, and you say, well, that's getting into people's business. Yes, that's called being a community. We're all a little bit in each other's business. You know what I mean? I'm just saying. That's, this, all right, Mike's meddling. Okay, it's let's move on to temperance. Yeah. Maintenance. Yeah, yeah. So What's that? That's correct. That's correct. We all need to pitch in. We do. Um, and you say, where do we get there? I don't know. Sometimes we just go places and we end up there. But uh, my church, my responsibility, right? But I think that the future of the American church looks like that. It doesn't look like what most mega churches in America look like today. It can't. That's not sustainable. And it actually doesn't look anything like the church that Jesus built. True. Just being super transparent. Is there a theme for something? What's that? Is there a dinner thing for Sunday? Uh, that is a great idea. Uh, oh, nachos. Yes. Yes, nachos. We're going to yeah. do nachos. I was going to tell you that. I'm so glad. Yes, nachos. What does that mean? It means nachos. Mm -hmm. I know, right? Okay, I think, I think it's been a while, so I think the church should actually provide multiple bags of nachos. Chips? Okay. Yeah, chips, sorry. Yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah, okay, there it no. is. Yeah, Brit doesn't, yeah, okay. So, tortilla chips because those are gluten-free anyways. Um, and I think we should also provide the meat, right? And then I will obviously pitch in toward that as well. And then everybody else can bring some fixings. I think we should do cheese and what, just in case. All right, so the church should do meat, cheese, and chips. And then somebody can be like, I'll bring the tomatoes. I'll bring the lettuce. It's I'll awesome. bring the sour cream, yeah. Yeah, salsa, stuff like that. So I'll put that on the church chat, nachos, and... Everybody can say, hey, I'll bring this, I'll bring this. I'll just say, this is what we need. Let's see how that goes. And if I put it on there and there's crickets, then we're going to have some tortilla chips with some meat and cheese. Okay, <laughs> that's the way it's going to go. All right. I think that'll be good. I think it'll be a good thing. Speaking of Mexican food. No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. It's, it's not. Really it's not. It, it I don't, I don't care if you be, eat it here. But it's oh, I'm going to eat later once I've right. got time to settle. 10-4. We actually just started, so despite the fact that we've been doing it for 23 minutes. Actually, and, and that's one of the reasons that I, I wasn't persuaded that we need a full 45 minutes to talk about temperance. Um, it's because I want to be temperate. No, um, it's it's because we, we've kind of mentioned it already, but also because I think it's a it's an idea that we all kind of grasp. We can only, we can only unpack it so much. It basically means not exceeding the boundaries. Um, Fire belongs in the fireplace. That's where it provides warmth, where it provides light. I almost said warmth, heat, and light. Ooh, Britt. He's yeah. from the, de the, the Department of Redundancy Department. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> I've said that one 30 times. I'm sorry. But it provides warmth and light, comfort, um, utility, all within the fireplace. But if it gets outside the fireplace, the house burns down. You know the illustration. I've shared that with you at least as many times as well. But that's what temperance is. Temperance is keeping something where it belongs. Temper okay, so what do you guys think? Where does temperance apply? We talked about the food thing, right? And the, so I think we all can agree it, it applies to food, all right? So get off me. No, I'm just joking. We all agree it applies to food. Where else does it apply? Adam? Being controlled by the spirit. Okay, in what regard? Well, like for instance, allowing every day, allowing God to have your day. Okay. Give me an example of what that might look like. 
Let's so, itemize. You know, getting up, you know, you know, talking to God, letting mm -hmm. him reveal to you what your what your day is gonna be. Okay. Okay. Uh, and like like a form of discipline. Yeah, yeah. But not, you know, like not like when we were kids, people telling us to control ourselves. Right, right. Because right. you couldn't really control yourself yeah. without the power of God. No, I, I, and I think like rising up early in the morning and saying, all right, God and I, we're going to set this course together. That's a way we can at least, you know, mm -hmm. uh, plan the foundation of being temperate, right? Because mm -hmm. if you say, God, this day is yours, you know darn well he's not going to say, I want you to spend, you know, nine hours driving go-kart. He may want, I don't know, he may want to do it, I guess, I don't know. But on vacation, maybe. Uh, Kevin uh, chimed in with two convicting ones. Yeah, jerk. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> one was use of time. Mm. Temperate in use of time. Moving right along. <laughs> no, that, that one gets me. That one gets me. Because a lot of times I think, okay, I'm home for the day. I spent wonderful time with my precious children. Now my time's my own. Brit time. Man time shooty gun time you know you know right it's just but maybe it's not and that's not a guilt trip on somebody who enjoys relaxing after a long day at work but i think what about that day off am i just going to spend that entire day doing a whole lot of nothing mm -hmm. right i was about to say yeah but no sometimes i think that could be relaxing like a vacation of sorts but if our lives are characterized by not having any boundaries on our time well imagine having a a bowl of soup without a bowl. It's just a spilled mess everywhere. <laughs> I can kind of see that, but in the same sense, I think it would kind of make me feel like, you know, God wants us to God wants us to live and enjoy life. Yeah. And if we're not allowing our ourselves to have that day to wind down, mm -hmm. I think that it will trying to constantly be yeah. moving and doing this constantly thinking what do i need to do what do i know oh, that's huge it's the same thing like for me thinking yeah. like is someone upset with me what have i done what yeah, have, yeah it's the same thing mentally you have yeah. to like you got to decompress you gotta have time so that's the reason i guard my sabbaths like you wouldn't believe lately saturdays are just off the table i'm like what's on your calendar for saturday i got appointments all day my couch no, I'm just joking on my couch. But like Saturday is a guarded day. I do very few things on Saturday. If I do, I'm taking one of the kids out for their special trip. I am taking the family out for lunch. Family day. It's a family day. And it is a day to completely relax. I'm glad I'm thankful for that um that nuance. Because I don't want to convey the image that the Sabbath is, you know, the Sabbath is God saying this is the day of rest. This is your time, so to speak, under God's management, right? In fact, the Sabbath, oh, here's this. What was the Sabbath originally? It was the day that they couldn't go get manna. Mm -hmm. Mana, what is this? Manna, like energy. Right? Well, manna was this food. Oh, manna, and magic energy, yeah. In a, yeah, Dungeons and, in Dungeons and Dragons style. But uh, but they, they got a double portion on Friday. And they couldn't order any order anything. Good grief! They couldn't. They couldn't. Yeah, they couldn't DoorDash. <laughs> they couldn't go out and grab any manna. Manner. I almost said manna. Um, and what was it? It was a forced dependence on God, because they couldn't go provide for themselves on the Sabbath. So that's a really interesting thing. Now I know not everybody has the luxury of not working on Saturday, but I hope everybody has one day off at least. Sunday. I don't personally see that as being, everybody's like, it's a new Sabbath. I don't subscribe to that at all. I flirted with it a little bit 10 years ago. Nope, don't believe it. Uh, there is nowhere in the scripture that Sunday is a new Sabbath. You know what the new Sabbath is? Jesus Christ. Jesus is the Sabbath. I know plenty you know? of people, though, that in my family, actually, yeah. that are like, hey, Paul, let's go do this today. Oh, yeah. It's Sunday. I ain't doing nothing. Yeah, yeah. Hey, and, come on, let's go. Let's go. Let's go do something. Right. Oh. Sunday. And what's interesting, my my children actually mentioned this uh, yesterday, this morning or yesterday. They said, uh, "Was it yesterday?" Yeah. No, well, I talked to all to all four of them this morning. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they said something yesterday or this morning, and they said, uh, "Dad, it's something to the effect of it's crazy that there's so many people who think the week ends on Sunday, and they, because they're picking up on the fact that we call it a weekend, Saturday and Sunday, it's a weekend." But that is how America sees it, that Saturday and Sunday are just two Saturdays. 
but that's actually mm -hmm. never the way it was ever structured, right? Mm -hmm. In America, we have a five-day week. Um, it that's very uh, we we have Jesus to thank for that, right? Otherwise, we would be working Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and resting on the Sabbath. Absolutely. So the Sunday, I don't believe that they're meant to replace Sabbath. Not to say we should all be workaholics on Sunday. We're very blessed in America to have a structure in the work week of Saturday and Sunday, and then the five business days. And I recognize having worked Saturdays most of my life, I understand not everybody has that. But again, mm -hmm. I hope that everybody has at least one day where they can say, this is for me and my family. That's a good thing. My concern with moderation is, what if somebody treated every day like it was a day of rest? Mm -hmm. I got home from work, now I'm just gonna rest. I'm gonna do this, now I'm gonna rest. Then all it is is going to work, rest and going. Are you productive in any other way in society? I'm just saying there's gotta be a balance somewhere. Yeah. Um, I know people who have jobs where they work like 25 hours a week and I said, what'd you do the rest of the week? Oh, we just kind of caught up on our TV show and kind of went out and did some sightseeing. Nothing wrong with enjoying a TV show or sightseeing, but if you're, if you're working 30 hours a week, what are the other 168 hours used for? Do you have any boundaries whatsoever around your time? Sometimes you got to force yourself to be productive. You can ask my wife what my, my one rule is, even on days off. I force myself to do at least one thing I don't want to do, or I am miserable. I, I, at the end of the day, I'll be like, it's been a day of rest, but I haven't gotten anything done. And then again, I don't want anybody to feel like they have to subscribe to my particular viewpoint. It's a day of rest, do whatever you want. But, but this idea of just sitting there like a potato from beginning to end, for me, that's not restful. That's restless. Does that make sense? I feel miserable at the end of that day. Susan? The U.S. work week was set up so as not to differentiate between Jews and Seventh-day Adventists and Christians. Oh, interesting. How about that? So they had both Saturday and Sunday. Saturday off. and Sunday. Hmm. Hmm. That's an interesting view. How about that? I hadn't heard that before. Adam? Our thing in our house is to, is accomplishing one thing for the day. Okay. Yeah. And, and you know, a lot of times you feel overwhelmed. And you say, oh, man, I'm in over my head. I can't do anything today. Just do that one thing. And uh, and that can be a great starting place for sure. Yeah, Corey? <laughs> I think, like, for me, whenever I get home, I don't stop moving. Yeah. If, like, whenever yeah, I first get home, I'm in the, I've got that work body. Yeah, you're still work, moving. i got that work energy going. I can come home. I can clean this whole church and not feel bad about it. <laughs> and I won't feel bad about you doing that either, bro. But no, I'm joking. But if I come home and I sit down. Yeah. I'm done. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't matter if Same. I sit down to eat. Same. If I sit down to eat, I'm done. Same. If there's something that needs to be done, I have to do it then. Yep. Or I'm done. I am the exact same way, truly. And I think, and it's really <laughs> cool that you know that about yourself, and I know that about me as well, is I'll get home and I'll go, I'll hop into the chair, hit the button on the side of the couch my wife made me buy, and the oh, leg yeah. rest goes up automatically. You can tell I really <laughs> detest her for making me buy it. And, uh, and, uh, it was merely the color. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That I insisted upon. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, that's not the important part. Come on. No. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, they'll kick back. I'm done. And now, again, if somebody says, hey, will you do this? Absolutely. Push the other button. <sighs> Go do it. But I don't want to, right? Um, so again, I don't want to. I don't want to sound like I'm overly nitpicking or scrutinizing anybody's personal day. That's certainly not my intent. Uh, everybody's going to treat their day off differently, right? Um, some people need a full day of rest. Other people, like me, say, "I need at least a half day, but I got to get moving, or I'm just going to feel like depressed at the end of the day." There's probably all kinds of people, right? The important thing is that we don't treat every day like a rest day, because that's not why we were made. The scriptures are very clear that Adam was put in the garden to work it and keep it. And then the children of Israel were given a day of rest. Even in the order of the seventh, the seventh day and in, 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 the, in, the, in the seven days of creation, God ceased from his labors. It's important. But again, um, where does slothfulness come in? It's when rest leaves the fireplace and burns the house down. Does that make sense? I know some people who work too hard. I do. Not most people, but I do know some people who work too hard. I know other people who don't work hard enough. You can't say that. Yes, I can. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, there is a spectrum in between. I hope to find a balance, right? Well, I've been both. Proverbs. 
Oh, that's exactly right, Kim. That's exactly right. The slothful man puts his hand in his bosom and it grieves him to bring it up to his yeah. mouth again, right? That's one of my favorite pictures. Yeah. Could I actually think yeah. of a sloth? <laughs> it's so funny. And the lion uh, in the street. Yeah, they're the lion in the streets. Yes. I've got one of an upcoming episode this this spring in the podcast. It's going to be called A Lion in the Streets. And uh, yeah, it should be fun. Um, what's that about? Uh, so, I struggle, so, I struggle with work. I, I work my days off. At work. Yeah, it's tough, right? And my boss tells me every got to take days off. I'm like, yeah. my wife understands why I'm doing it. Matt actually <laughs> made me take, uh, well, pretty much every vacation except for this last one that I planned. Matt has sat me down in his office and said, hey, Michael, you have to take days I off. I work 60 to 65 hours a week, every week. Yeah, yeah. I came in complaining I'm working about 50, so don't steal my thunder. You can't take that from me. No, I'm just joking. That's uh, <laughs> just what I was ready to work. Yeah, yeah. Mother, that's, that's how she taught me. Work hard, be the kind of people, be honest. Yeah. And your scenario, you're in sales. So you miss a, you miss an hour, you could miss a lot. You know what I mean? It's a big deal. That's a huge that's a hugely different environment than say my job or food service or driving. You're in control of your income. People think it's not hard work. It's mentally draining. Oh, yeah. it's debilitatingly so hard many sometimes. Different people you have to deal with so many different situations. <laughs> oh yeah. And you get yeah. home, you're just like Finance. And you have to, you have to, yeah, yeah. And then I do finance. It's even worse. Then you mm -hmm. have to be like, now you got to sell them this, and you got to convince them to do this. And yep. You know, it's just constant. You're not. You're always. You're always. You have to be. And you might there's have an. To be strong the whole time. There's an essence to sales, right? Where it's kind of like I call it chameleoning, right? Where you have to, you have mm -hmm. to jive with sales that person. You know what I mean? Sales is an art. And so you're mentally always working. It's huge. I you know, obviously you know I was in sales for seven years. It's very challenging. Um, in that way. So mentally taxing. So obviously in any situation, I have no qualm saying this because we're buddies. My challenge to you would absolutely be to force yourself to take a day off. You won't listen to me. No, I'm just joking. But just like I wouldn't listen to anybody else, right? But but I think I think it is a good goal for people like you, not necessarily you necessarily, but people like you who have such a drive, you're going to be the kind of person who needs to draw those boundaries and say, I'm going to take this day off. But the people on the other end of the spectrum, like I said, they're going to be the kind of people who don't need any encouragement to take a day off. We've had both kinds at Brackley Electric. And... Uh, we have more of that in our country now than we used to have. What's that? Thanks to the government, we have more of that in our country now than we used to have. Well, it's funny because I mentioned this podcast episode, Lying in the Streets, that's actually part of a two-part series I'm doing. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's part of a two-part series I'm doing called The Disability Dilemma, in that there are people who need disability in, in part of our social safety net. I'm thankful we live in a country that can do that. But um, statistics, this is real statistics, not Michael Britt made up statistics, um, show a staggeringly high. And when I say staggeringly, think more than 70%. Staggeringly high a number of people who are on disability who actually don't need disability. And that's that's frightening for people who actually do need it. They don't get the care they need. You know what I'm Sucks saying? Sucks the resources. What's that? Sucks the resources. It sucks the resources right out, right? And that's another perfect example of moderation. What do you mean moderation? Oh, it's huge. Let's say, oh man, I stubbed my toe. Okay. I had a guy um, in one of the shipyards slip down the stairs. Boom, 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 boom. I don't know. He's probably, I don't know, 40, 45, 50. And uh, when you get checked out, went right back to work. That guy could have milked a worker's comp claim. Mm -hmm. A lot of people do. Is it sin? Yes. Yes, it is. It's theft, it's lying, and it's slothfulness. It's absolutely sin. We need to not be afraid to call out these societal issues for what they are. Um, now, I'm not saying that if he actually needed the rest to take a day, I would have been fine with that. But he said, no, I'm going to go right back out there. So I don't know, maybe he's working too much. Maybe, he, I don't know what his lines are, but I do know there is an excess in anything like taking disability or, you know, whatever. You can abuse that. And again, what are we talking about? Something good, disability, taken out of the fireplace, burns a house down, nationally speaking. Adam? Um, there was this kid that I knew at the church I grew up in. He got his arm amputated for having cancer. In it. Mm. And they sent him, they would send him a monthly check. He's not alive anymore, but they'd send him a monthly disability check for 600 a month. He would never go get a job. He'd just sit on playing Wii. Yeah. Well, you know, it's tricky, right, Adam? Because I, I, I struggle because I, I have both arms, you know, and from my point of view, oh, yeah, you can get out there and you can flip burgers with one hand. You know, it's easy, right, for me to to uh, to say that he shouldn't have gotten that amount. Um, 
but I'll go ahead and throw this out there just for, you know, consideration. I'm not refuting what you're saying, but just my commentary on it would be um, let's, let's purge the ones who still have all four limbs who are perfectly working before we look at the ones with three limbs, right? Triage, as it were, um, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, and there's a lot of un unseen battles that people fight. That's why I'm not a Medicare prof medical professional and I can't gauge whether somebody needs disability or not. But I do know that the numbers bear out from medical professionals that a lot of people do abuse the system. And that's a staggering lack of moderation. Susan? I, I worked as a social worker. Right. Um, with adults with mental illness, diagnosed mental illnesses. Mm -hmm. And there were a handful of people who I suspect shouldn't have been on the roll. Mm -hmm. But that's up to the psychiatrist who sure. diagnosed them. Sure. Uh, but overall, it's an unseen disability. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to, or deafness is another one that's an sure. unseen disability. Oh, well, yeah. And it's hard to, or blindness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah actually is a little easier to see where Kim has a, a stick guide that she uses. Mm -hmm. That makes it a little easier to see that she has a genuine disability. Sure, yeah. And, but a deaf person, you don't see that. It's true. It's true. Or someone with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a, I have a relative who suffered from hearing impairment. Not, not my brother or my mother. Is, um, and they went and got it. They managed to finagle their way into a handicap placard for their car because technically they were disabled. And, uh, and I said, e come on, you don't need that. Well, I'm disabled and there's people, and there's people who actually have a hard time walking who don't get to park in that spot because, well, there's moderation in need again, right? Oh, yeah. Te just cause you can, doesn't mean you should. Let's, let's, let's look at the spirit of the law well before we let, don't let the letter of the law be your boundary. You'll always find loopholes. Come on guys, remember mm -hmm. Matthew 5, 6, and 7? You'll mm -hmm. always find loopholes. The smarter you are, the easier it'll come. No, it doesn't even have anything to do with intelligence. It's, no, it human has nothing beings. to do with human beings, you know? You will eventually find a loophole. This um, makes me think of a guy I used to work with at my last job, everybody called him Pee Wee. He's an older guy. He had been working for Manchester Tank for 40 years, mm -hmm. 40, 45, really good dude. Um, and he lost his pension, the union, uh, oh. by, by one vote, oh. um, by one vote and lost his pension. They had an X amount of time to, well, anyways, so he now is still working there oh. and can't retire because he can't afford to. Well, the thing is, is his back is so bad that he is literally going to the doctor multiple times a week. Mm -hmm. He's getting shots mm -hmm. in multiple spots in his spine yep. just to be able to stand up and work. And he literally is like, he's popping pills all yeah. day just to, yeah. just to be able to work. And the thing about it is, is they know. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. He's a good dude, but I'll be honest, he's high as a kite all day. Sure. And we call it Big Red, but it's this huge, massive forklift. Mm -hmm. And it takes off the big still uh, metal uh, spools of yeah. met, you know, only one semi can carry it, one sure. of them. Wow. If that tells you how heavy it is. Really, mm -hmm. I could probably lift it up. And so Big Red <laughs> is a huge machine. And that's part of his job is to drive that. And he's just yeah. hiring a kite, driving yeah. it, you yeah. know. And But what are they going to do, get rid of him? See, that's the thing, right? You're telling this story. And it's, an, it's a huge tragedy of our society because my, in my mind, I'm thinking of two solutions that we actually can't enact. One, what's the scriptural principle for when somebody gets a little older? They're taken care of by their family. Like your kids should take care of you. That's not a, huh, oh, well, that's really nice. No, it's actually a scriptural pattern. Your children should take care of you. Meanwhile, but we don't. <laughs> what's that? Me and my mom were actually working, we're talking about that because we lived, yeah, you know. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I said, I'm going to throw you in the home. <laughs> well, so, so that's you know, one solution, right, right? Is, is that kids ideally, ideally, and again, is it always possible? No, I'm talking about the ideal, right? Mm -hmm. Another solution, let's go back in time and make this guy have a really good diet and practice really good posture. Diet is responsible for a ton of inflammation, tons of mental illness, uh, tons of long-term diseases and maladies. It's diet. Mm -hmm. I said it before, I'll say it again, I'll say it for the rest of my entire life, it's diet. Uh, and some degree of activity. Got to I got a great activity. diet. So I got my posture. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so, I 
lifestyle. Lifestyle, agreed, agreed, yeah. So diet is a more clinical term, right? What you put in, right? But your lifestyle, your nutritional lifestyle is huge. Now, the reason I mentioned those because we can't go back in Pee Wee's life and change these things for him. So what are we left with? That's the reason for the social safety nets. Taking care of- Of people who's- Because you also have to think is, as an older man, at that, the generation that he grew up in, they yeah. didn't think the way that my generation, your generation do about health, about oh, that's food. True. That's huge. You know, they didn't have, that's they huge. didn't have food ninjas whenever they, you know, <laughs> grind up your celery and make yeah. soup out of it. That's but, right. You know what I mean? So I love you, dude. No, but you're right. Nutrition. I mean, they, they were back and forth on whether eggs were bad for you and good for you. And that'll change another 30 times in our lifetime. But, but like, but you're right. The more we learn about health, the more we realize how important it is against, you know, colorectal cancers, even even pancre pancreatic cancer, brain cancer, stroke, heart disease, diabetes. All of these things are directly linked to diet as the number one cause. Not even smoking, drinking, uh, what was it? chewing, gambling, uh, fornicating, doing heroin. Diet. I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's, let's leave heroin out of them. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. We had a guy. We had a guy working for the shipyard, and he left the yard one time with a real bad toothache. And man, a real bad toothache. Gotta leave. Uh, he got fired a little while later, and turns out he was a meth head, and that explained the toothache. You know, it's uh, one of those things. But again, you know, now, ooh, that's huge. And again, we're just going down an ethics rabbit hole, but it really all does talk about moderation. And I'm not afraid to go here. We got a good tether. Should somebody on disability who's destroyed their own lives through bad habits, should they get it? Ethically speaking, that's what I thought. Right? I know, right? I know. Should they so, like, be allowed to right, get it? I mean, no? Right. And so that's the tricky thing, right? Because let's say somebody has destroyed their life and they've been told, remember, remember the little red hen? Mm -hmm. You're not going to help me make the flour. You're not going to help me knead the stuff. You're not going to help me bake it. Now everybody wants to piece it apart. So these guys are told, do not destroy your life with drugs, booze, all that. And then you get to the point when you're 61 and you're falling apart because of abuse of body. And then everybody's like, oh man, they qualify. They're, they're really, I'm not saying they shouldn't. I would never say that I am not the arbiter of who gets help. Never, never, never. Far from me to be that. I cannot possibly remove myself from that enough. But on a principle, on a principle, I think triage should at least favor those who've tried on principle. Amber, um, now that I've dug a hole, <laughs> sorry. No, I think that, uh, so where would you draw the line with that? So what right. about the kid who, it says no diving off the cliffs and he dove off the cliff and breaks his neck or his back and then right. he can't take care of himself for the rest of his life. I know. So, I, know. I mean, technically he, he may have broken a law to do it. Right. And right. it's really no different. Which is where grace and mercy comes in. And we should always be ready to extend it because it's been extended to us plenty. In fact, <laughs> when somebody goes to the hospital, nobody's going to check what they've been eating for the last six years before they treat him. <laughs> Sorry. Nobody's going to be checking what they've eaten for the last six years before they, they try to administer care. That's the beauty of the hospital system is the Hippocratic Oath and such. So there is, there is, but I think on principle, on principle, if there's two discrete cases, and I know this is a bit of a trolley problem. It's a bit of a Sophie's choice. I understand that. But on, on principle, uh, I think the Proverbs would be very clear that, uh, that there should be at least some degree of triage when someone says, look, I've tried, I've contributed, functional member of society rather than the person who's been leeching off the whole life. It is not, it, it may seem unmerciful, but if there is only one drug to be given, so to speak, you've got a very difficult choice to make. But on principle, I think the choice, when you remove all emotions from it, not that we should be doing that as Christians, but when you do, I think the principle is, it has a clear result, well, right? I mean, that, that principle is in you being used if you look at the the organ donors, and the people who receive like the liver and stuff. Huge. If you are an alcoholic and you've destroyed your liver, you're at the bottom of the list to receive one. Everybody else goes above you on that list if they can tell that you have been like an alcoholic and you've destroyed that liver yourself. That is that is such a good point. Now I feel like I'm not the bad guy the medical system is. No, but like, but seriously, that's that's the, that's a huge point. That, and it makes perfect sense. And, every, and you say, that's terrible. There's only so many hearts to go around. You know what I mean? And it's not, and again, we're removing all of the, the, the emotion and the, and, the, and, the, and the, I almost said semantic, but you know what I mean? The, the whatever. Cinematics. The, yeah. <laughs> That's the right word. <laughs> we're removing all the cinematic. We're all the cinematic. And, uh, and I was going to bring up Kevin as well, because he doesn't yeah. get to be a part of this just because he's short. 
Yeah. That doesn't mean that he gets to yeah. qualify. Should he get disability? He should. No, no. He could, not, he could beat us both up. So It's just. <laughs> yeah, he could, though. No, but um, vertically challenged. Uh, Kevin had another. Oh, Susan. Um, years, decades ago, the health industry focused on cholesterol as a yeah. thing to avoid in the yeah. diet. And remove eggs. Yeah. Turns out eggs are actually quite healthy. Yes. Uh, the actual culprit is sugar. Of course yeah, it is. Absolutely it is. Eggs aren't healthy, but, you know. Well, <laughs> we'll save that for the... But here's the thing. They've actually shown that uh, edible... Or, um, I will agree that it is how chickens are fed makes them healthier, less healthy. Sure. Right. So... Right. Oh, yeah. and Or cannibalizing chicken. That's another thing. But anyways... Um, all that to say, uh, 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 oh, it's right there. Come on, Britt. It was actually a good one. It wasn't I just know, a mental meandering. It was so, I was so close. Doesn't have to keep our talking. Uh, um, um, Reach out for yes. Travel. So they've shown, got it. They've shown that dietary cholesterol has no effect on your HDL or LDL. Yeah. None. You We're can about, eat all the cholesterol you want. Yeah. Your body does not absorb that and make it its own cholesterol. What produces cholesterol is sugar. And yet, when Twizzlers hit the shelves, what did they say on the packaging? A fat-free food. Sure Fats are good for you. It's, it is a fat-free food. But it will kill you. Why? Because it's loaded with processed sugars. But just because it will kill you doesn't mean that you're not going to enjoy the process. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Say, cool. about this is like, yeah. They say by 2034, we won't have Social Security anymore. Oh, sure. Right. So because I think of, yeah. And I think that's in part due to the aging. Yeah. And also in part due to them gambling with social security funds that they should have never touched. But the other part is uh, because I think it's being distributed uh, improperly to people who don't actually need it. Now, aside all that, Corey mentioned something to get us back on track and he didn't even know it. Yeah, I he's, mean, you have to be able to enjoy the process yes, of dying. Correct, correct. He's actually entirely correct. Where do you draw the line between I'm never eating Twizzlers because I wanna live forever or I'm going to eat all the Twizzlers because I know I'm not going to live forever. Well, the reality is you're not going to live forever. So Solomon actually said, and, and it wasn't just Solomon, but in Ecclesiastes chapter 9, enjoy your drink. Your, he said, drink your wine, enjoy your food, enjoy the wife of your youth. This is what it means to live. Only in moderation. Though. Correct. That's the key. Solomon, of all people, would have been the first one to say, I've seen the excess, and it doesn't bring happiness. So live in moderation and enjoying the life that God gave you. Kevin also mentioned finances, finances. Mm -hmm. How do we be moderate with our finances? I've got plenty to say on this, but I'm gonna try to, you know, we got about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna try to not bloviate too much, but let's just state the obvious. Don't go on vacation and to the point where you can't even give to the church. Ooh, that's a good point, right? Putting God first, that's huge. God, you have given me all that I am, including the, lung, the air in my lungs and the blood in my heart. See ya. That's terrible. I mean, we, we would all agree that's terrible. I think it's a good idea to, you know, think about, well, I've got a family, so I've got to have X amount of money put in my savings account. Like, have a set number. Like, I need $2,000 in my savings account before I have vacation money. Yeah, yeah. If the $2,000 that I have in my savings account is my vacation money, yeah. well, when I blow it and I get back and something happens yep. and – now I can't make it to work or I can't pay my bills. I've, I've seen now I have to yeah. ask the church for help. I've seen it so many times. People have a ton of bills. They get a nice tax return or a or windfall of money, so to speak, a few hundred, a few thousand bucks. And then they spend it on junk food and trips. And I'm like, mm. but again, that's, that's, that's immaturity. That's childishness. And we all need to grow out of that because it has everything to do with moderation. Moderation. So here's my moderation. Hit me with it, man. I tell Stefan, you can spend all the money you want as long as we have money in the bank. I love it. <laughs> I can pay the bills. Yep. You there you go. You want to spend. There you go. Because I can't say no to her anyway. So, Do, so, so here's my secret. <laughs> I can't say no to Amber either. So every week I put X amount of dollars into an account well, that's still really linked to our account, but it just gets fed right through. That way she can just swipe her card until it burns well, up she, in her hand. So she, doesn't, she, does her business, she doesn't buy anything. She does, her business, plus she, does, she does DoorDash every day. That is cool. So she, I'm that is cool. Her, she cool. can't spend her money if she wants. No, 10-4, yeah. She doesn't spend it on, she does it because we have, so she does, it all goes right towards one bill. Mm -hmm. Everything she does for DoorDash, she yep. has to pay off one bill. Yep, day. and that's huge. I think that's huge. And here's the thing. Um, here's a great example, right? Amber and I are going on a trip to Boston, end of the month. 
Uh, I actually put it on the card because I want the points. I don't use my credit card a lot, but I'll use it once a year because I want the points for big purchases. So if I'm spending a thousand bucks on a hotel room, I want the points from that purchase, right? Can you get 2% back? There's your, there's your 20 bucks, right? That's 2%, anybody? All right. Is it rewards credit card? Did you just try to... Citibank. Anyway, on so, so my point is, and I'm not saying I spent a thousand bucks in a room, it's just a round figure, right? So, so let's say I spent a thousand bucks in a hotel room, you get 20 bucks back, you're 2% back. Okay, great. Also, it keeps the credit line alive. Great. Awesome. I used a credit card. But if I don't have the money to pay that back right away, should I be going on vacation? Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe not. It's tricky. Do families need some time away? Yeah. Should they be getting themselves in debt to do it? I personally don't think it's appropriate. I think debt is a tool to be used, not a master under which we should be enslaved. Plan a staycation. What's that? Plan a staycation. Plan a staycation. I've actually given that Camp counsel to a number of people. And, yeah, you know, nothing wrong with that, Susan. Tom and I uh, purchase a lot of things through credit cards, mm -hmm. but we never have a balance left. That's right. At the end of the month. That's right. We paid the whole thing. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's my advice to anybody. And obviously, if you're not able to pay your balance off, I, I suppose if somebody's trying to use credit as a tool, like a, a car or a house or a large purchase, I totally get it. But what I think, and I'm not exaggerating when I tell you this, probably, probably my assessment, this is unqualified, I don't have numbers. My assessment would be that over 90% of all credit card purchases are on extemporaneous or frivolous things, mm -hmm. things that people don't actually need. And they usually have like three or four of these credit cards. Oh, sure. Yeah. Depending on how much money they make. Sure. They probably got three or four of them and they're all yep. like bottomed out. Yep. Yep. Well, some people have to use credit cards for medical. Yeah. I was just thinking we about that. We had a family that yeah. yeah. had, a, had a child with, yep. well, two children with genetic defects. Yep. Yep. And they were drowning in debt. Mm. Mm. But, you know. Now, talk about moderation. Wouldn't it be nice if we got rid of the, the what do they call the hospital book? Uh, the charge book? Is that what it's called? The book of accounts? Whatever. Every hospital has a book that they charge the insurance companies X amount for. That's why you pay $142 for a Band-Aid that costs literally less than one cent to produce. Why? Because they know they're not going to get paid by everybody and the insurance companies aren't going to pay them in full. A lot of people are on Medicare that pay like 40 to 60% of your bill, etc. They have to structure these things if they want to stay in business. Why? It's all because of top-down corruption. You get rid of the corruption, you could actually have universal health care. I'm not advocating for universal health care because right now it couldn't happen because it'd be compulsory socialism but in an ideal scenario do you know that you pay for traffic lights out of your taxes you pay for police officers don't you mm -hmm. you pay for a lot of firefighters why can't we do that with medic because the medical system is so broken and corrupt that people have to use credit cards just to pay their bill because of the corruption right to the medical right. system i don't know if i understand but that's kind of like to me universal health care is like biden was going to pay off people's student loans but other people already paid them off and they're not getting anything. Right. So right. I don't, think, I don't believe that universal health care is, is even remotely. Well, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying if there was no corruption, it could be just as accessible as as like a traffic light or a police officer where you say, oh, my goodness, I'm having a heart attack. You shouldn't. Ideally, you shouldn't. Not, and I'm not. Hold on just one second. Anyways, I thought that's 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 exactly my point. You go to the hospital, they're going to treat you, and you say, "Oh, I don't have anything to pay." Have it already, right? And that's and that's the huge part. And you say, "Well, then it's that person's fault." No, because you have to trace the corruption back further. You've got you've got hundreds of people getting extremely rich, <coughs> billions of dollars. And when the early church started hospitals, they were true nonprofits. They weren't not for profits. They were nonprofits. And and in that sense, healthcare, believe it or not was actually kind of universal in that nobody could just but what you did was you chipped in you did what you could maybe you volunteered something like that probably had if you had we had the rich families buy out big pharma buy out health care the rothschilds they own that oh man they yeah own. oh yeah the oligarchy 100 percent. Hundred percent. it all started and they decided we're going to buy it and you're going to abide by what we say to do yep so, yeah, yeah. Just corrupt. Healthcare well, is corrupt. You're right. It's, uh, it's, it's corrupt from the top down. A lot of a lot of institutions you are. Has a snake on it. You notice that? Well, <laughs> believe it or not, have a snake on it. believe it or not, that actually so. comes from uh, Moses holding up the serpent on the pole. No. Uh, that would Delicious. that's it goes back to that, which is really cool. But uh, called Nahushtan, uh, the serpent on the pole. But There's um, a medication. I had I've had options to take a lot of medication. Mm -hmm. There was one point where I came, my even my neurology said. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't be taking this many medications. Mm -hmm. And there was two medications extra than I take three now. And 
I was digging at five, and the last two were making me like a zombie. They, I was always sleeping. I could not, I really could not function. I, and I was like, I can't do this anymore. I got, I don't really need this medication. Yeah. So I just need these two, and I'm trying to get off on another one, and uh, you know, because uh, a medication and one of my seizures are already under control, and I'm just getting it for, you know, to help me sleep, but it's for yeah. Seizures. Yeah, nobody wants to be on medication if they don't need to be, right? That's it's all. Like I when I was a kid, they said I had ADD. Or, <laughs> yeah, ADD. Yeah. Which I do. I'm not gonna lie. I do have a. I've got, I think many people in the world have issues letting their brain shut off. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is, is like they give me. To, I got to the point where I was taking six pills in the morning and six pills at night. Goodness gracious! I got to the point where I was like my stepsisters everybody would be out my dad actually seen this and brought it up to my mom because i'd go over to my dad's house on the weekend and my stepsisters we'd all be outside playing in the summer and i just sit on the trampoline just like that like a yeah. zombie i wouldn't want i wouldn't even play and it'd yeah. be beautiful outside yeah. and finally i told my mom i'm like i'm done i'm not taking this anymore mm. and we didn't know how to take yeah get off of this stuff yeah, yeah well i just stopped well i went to the school the next day and i was like like calling my mom, like I'm, I'm think I'm dying. I was sweating, like I was coming off of these pills. Yeah. And yeah. No, I, and and again, I don't want to. I don't want to. I'm not a, you know, I, I don't want to abuse my position here as, as somebody who's in leadership and and talk about you know get all the kids off of the ADD drugs. But I, I think it's I think everybody's in universal agreement, even most doctors that they're probably overprescribed, even most smart doctors, anyways. Well, you know, I, I as a, as a kid that took the medicine, I yeah. actually told my mom like. I think that I would rather have you bust my hind end than take this. Yeah, no, 100%. because as I grew older, I realized like this isn't something that a medicine is going to prevent. Like yeah. this is something I have to learn how to prevent. Yeah, a lot of it's behavioral. And again, I don't want to get too far into the weeds there, but I think a lot of it's diet. A lot of it's behavioral. Um, and I don't want to, but I really do want to bring it back to moderation as we wrap up because we got a bunch of hands in the air. But uh, Adam, Susan, Amber, Adam. Okay, two more things. One, um, I think we should go back to the home care doctor where, you know, the doctor would come to your house. He would uh, mm -hmm. look at you, examine yep. you. Yep. He knew your baby. And yep. He knew you. And health care was much affordable back then. That would be preferable. What's number two? And number two is my brother. I had a couple brothers who were on Ritalin. Mm -hmm. Um my dad took them off. There was no change in their behavior. So the medication didn't work. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. And that's, I think, been a common theme, you know, and, and I'm not saying that it never works for anybody, but again, I over prescription might be maybe where I'd land on that, but I, I really don't want to get too much into the weeds there. Susan. And a lot of that prescribing had more to do with the system designed around females. kickbacks Wait, around what now? Females. Oh, well, sure. We're teaching females in a sit down environment in mm -hmm. school and the mm -hmm. boys want to be active. Yes, yes. No, you're a hundred percent. I really think you're right on target is, is men, boys and girls are not the same. Boys and girls are not the same. And boys are by nature a bit more rambunctious. They want to wrestle. My girls have wrestled like twice, at least while I'm home. My boys wrestle all the time. Thump, it's thump, very, thump, you know. it's very short. The right. boys, man, boys they don't the she how to wrestle. Right, right. So, but, but it is, it is typical that uh, we live in a society that is seeking to eliminate gender roles and gender differences. And so when you are born into that society, that's, that's what's going to happen. Wifey? Um, so I was going back to temperance. Yeah, that's what I was hoping to was, get us back um, full circle. Was uh, that um, that temperance isn't isn't like, it's not just talking about balance. It's talking about um, mastery. Yep. Self-control, yes. mastery yep. over yep. your desires, and that you're not you're not um, a slave to your desires. You are a master over yep. yourself and your flesh. Yep. So I want sugar, but I'm going to master myself, and I'm going to allow myself a treat when appropriate. I'm yep. not going to allow that desire for what I want to right. control me. I'm going to be a master of it, whatever it happens to be. And I think that's really the perfect way to sum it up, right? Because <clears throat> we talked about finances. We talked about even corruption. We've talked about food. The conversation could easily go into sexual desire. That's a huge one we didn't touch on, but it's mm -hmm. 
urges, choreographic you know, stuff. Yeah. Bodily yeah. urges. Yeah. Exactly. Bodily urges of all kinds, right? Um, ambition, power, right? Wealth, money. I want money. At, at what point are you going to master these things versus letting them master you? Um, you guys know that for the longest time, I gave up video games completely. Cold turkey. Why? Because they had become my master. I mean... It, it was rough. It was rough. I, I, I still I still have my my real, uh, you know, I still I still have my own obsessions and I still ah, great example to wind it down. In my pocket are two recent acquisitions of, of uh, my Pokemon card collection. I just collect one. There's over a thousand Pokemon. I collect one. Why do I why do I focus on just one? I have to narrow it down or I'm going to buy every single one and my home will be filled. So I'm collecting every edition of this is Scyther as the name of the Pokemon because I grew up with Pokemon and, and what these are, these are investments, I tell myself. And uh, no, they are investment. They will go up in value and I can't wait to hand them down to my kids, all of whom really enjoy Pokemon. And they'll be able to say, it was a fun part of my dad's childhood. It was a fun part of my childhood. And We'll pay off the house with them. You know what I mean? Like whatever, right? But what these are, it's a great picture of a couple of obsessions that I used to have when we first got married. All right, babe? Um, <laughs> Javaya mugs. Mm -hmm. Anybody ever seen that movie where the, where Mel Gibson's character had to buy every copy of Catcher in the Rye that he saw? Mel Gibson was programmed like a Manchurian. What was the name of that? Memento is? No, no. not Memento. Um, um, no. I don't know. But... No. Look at me. I have absolutely no idea. Right. She is nine months pregnant. Anyway. She will, yeah. I don't remember any Mel Gibson. But, but anyway, the, the theme of this film was that Mel Gibson was uh, programmed. Conspiracy what? Conspiracy theory. Conspiracy theory. Yeah. He was programmed by a government agency to be uh, a sleeper cell, to be a sleeper cell of sorts. And one of the symptoms of his, of his programming was that every time he saw a copy of Catcher in the Rye, he had to buy it in the bookstore. And so he had tons and tons of catcher in the rye at his house and i have which was his trip his apartment right, right exactly right yeah you go to his apartment it's catcher in the rye from, from top to bottom yeah. um and it was just part of his little you know mk ultra style programming well here's here's the here's the point of that illustration we would safely say that mel gibson showed no moderation he was programmed to buy every single one he saw for me it was javaya mugs javaya is an obscure brand of coffee from the swedish area or mm -hmm. swedish alps or whatever yeah. it was and the mugs come with a 24 karat gold plated rim and you could get them at thrift stores for like 99 cents and they were worth like seven bucks. So, and in Oklahoma city, there's so many thrift stores. I actually had a route I took home from work once in a while and hit all the thrift stores on the way back to my apartment. Um, that's how many thrift stores there are. And I would find these Javaya mugs and I would, I bought shelves, hangers, don't mock me. And I would display all of my Javaya mugs. And when we got married, I had this huge Javaya mug collection. It served no purpose, and I, it had turned into an obsession where I could not say no if I saw one. I had no interest in saying no if I saw one. Why would I say no, said Smeagol about the ring, right? Uh, it was just my thing. The precious. Yeah, my process, you know. Um, <laughs> call them. So anyway, so, so uh, I guess the point is, for me, it's, it never really stopped being fun because I was too blind to see that it was controlling me rather than I was controlling it. Even in a married relationship, carnal relation, carnal desires can be controlling and make it not fun, right? Mm -hmm. Finances, you think, you think you're spending and you're having fun. Amber and I are both acquainted with somebody that we love who, who just his whole life has never managed finances well. And now he's, he's asking people for money and having to humble himself. And it's really, it's really sad to see because um, spending was never something that he had a lot of moderation or temperance in. Um, the good news is if you're hearing this now, there's still time to begin to be temperate. Maybe you struggle with finances. Maybe you struggle with lust. Maybe you struggle with anger. Maybe you struggle with emotion. Maybe you struggle with vanity. Vexation. <laughs> vanity and vexation of spirit. Well, I used to say this. I used to say this. Come on, shut up, Mike. I'm trying. I'm trying. I used to say this. You wouldn't walk around with a wallet full of two by threes of yourself, would you? Well, I unless mean, if you were an aspiring actor, right? To to correct, correct. <laughs> and yet, They're and all yet, of you. I know, right? That's the thing, right? So no, but, but you wouldn't do that. And yet in our social media, we post just pictures and pictures and pictures of ourselves and up to their profile picture every 30 seconds. And we're just obsessed with ourselves. That's not moderate, right? 
talking about you're, that's vain. Vanity is another, you take good self-esteem out of the fireplace, let it burn the house down, that's vanity. And guys, my whole point in starting this, and I'm going to shut up with it, is temperance is simply letting good things stay good by letting them stay in the fireplace. Sin only ever was and only ever will be a distortion of something that originally was good. And temperance is letting it stay good. Susan? We have a son who has ended up with two divorces because of an obsession mm. with uh, action figures. Sure, yeah. yeah. He pays storage fees monthly, yeah. although he sees it as an investment. Yeah. He's actually draining his yeah. finances. Yeah, babies used to be. Uh, oh, I've got plenty of them in the Foot Locker. Because he ended up yep. with two beautiful women uh, not, no longer in his life. In his life. That took over. Yep. That was more important. Yep. They wanted him to stop. Yep. And so both times he chose the toys over the, the marriage. It's huge. Um, yep. That's huge. It's, uh, what is it? uh, it's, it's, it's a seduction. Yes. And yes. Yeah. It's part of sin. Yeah. And what if it's like working on the house? What if it's things that start out as good? Maybe even a figure action figure investment. That could be fun and good, but it can also take over your life. Even good things. Like again, working on the house. That could be a good thing. But if you're always doing it, that's not moderate or temperate. Um that's the reason why the rest are playing wow again, knowing that um I never I knew I, I knew I would never play wow if I was married unless she was playing she with you. It's something me. you can do together. Because I know that I will. I get sucked in. Yeah. And I don't want her sitting in the background and me right. come home and right. just play WoW and her in the background. Yeah. Or, so it's like, but now that she she plays with me. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's something it's you enjoy a, together. It's a family yeah. thing. We, we can run around and run, run the man together. Yeah. You can think about so, what it is. They'll do whatever you want to do just to spend time with you. Not all of them. <laughs> so um, it's funny because when, when you guys, and WoW is a video game called World of Warcraft. It's a very popular video game. And I used to play for years and years and years. I got all leveled up. I was very, I was very invested into the game. And the, these fellas started playing it. No, you're, you're a fella. You're not a fella. But these folks started playing it. And, uh, and um, sure enough, and I said, oh, man. And just looking at the loading screen, I was like, oh, man, I really want to play this. And I said, right there, I said, right downstairs, as if they'd asked me, they didn't even ask me. I said, nope, I'm not playing it ever again. I can't get back into it. Why? Because that'll suck me right dry. My time, even maybe my money, 15 bucks a month, I didn't cheat. You know what I'm saying? And it would just not be good. I have enough stuff I struggle with. I don't need to add that to the pile. You know what I'm saying? Like a, um, a woman doing her nail, getting her nails done. Yeah, good once in a while. Yeah, I right? only did it for my wedding. Yeah. And, yeah. And, uh, but I'm like, you know, this one's always trying to push it on me. And I'm like, Adam, that taste that takes maintenance, and that's just why. You know? Right, right. And plus, my nails can grow long if I wear them. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Ralph, you were next. And the, and the hardest thing is that you think if you went back to it, you'd start slowly, but you don't. You jump in worse than you were with the left. You ain't wrong, brother. And see, even the scriptures do tend to give an illustration of that, right? The demons cast out, but he comes back with seven more. I think that's a common. I, it sounds to me like that, that that smacks of like a Jewish midrash or a Talmudic teaching, like something that existed around Jesus this time that they taught. And I think they picked up on something very human, um, that it is very easy for something when you give it up and then you get back into it, it's worse. It's like a diet. Yeah. You give up, you give up, like you get, you start a diet, yep. you lose 10 pounds, yep. you stop your diet. And all or, of a sudden, and then you, 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 you gain, 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 obviously in my fundamental Bible college that I went to um, that permanent sugar costs money because like the, my teacher in Christian marriage and home was from Alabama. Mm -hmm. and he would say like, he took his wife to the 
the store one time. She got a perm. It was four dollars, but this was way back in the day. Sure, sure. Four dollars was expensive, and she would come to him and say, "I'm worth it," and stuff like that. Yeah. And he was saying having a wife costs money because she got to have all that maintenance, supposedly. Well, I will say this, guys: it's one thing to say, "Well, honey, you don't need that." that perm for four dollars and then you spend eight bucks on a round of golf two bucks on a lottery ticket three bucks on mcdonald's at work uh shame on you or makeup right if they want to wear makeup let them, let well, them wear makeup. well that's the thing and again it's about priorities and i think that kind of bleeds into moderation but since we're here it's about priorities i've heard so many men complain about what their wives cost and everything like that and you don't need I, that makeup yeah you and better I, put your mouth about it right and there's wow that was <laughs> Get a little personal now. That was something, dude. All right. You, you silenced the whole church. Yeah, yep. that's a good way to end it. I love you guys.